Good morning. Uh, what a great pleasure to be here today. Um, is this working? Can you hear me? No. Nope. So I have three microphones, apparently, <laughs> but <laughs> I need a fourth one. <laughs> okay, so the fourth one works. Um, so why most clinical research is not useful? Um, that's the title of, uh, of the talk. And uh, I, I have to say that it's not about what I have been trying to do over the years, which is to convince myself that most of my research is wrong. Um, you know, I think that I have uh, convinced myself that this is so, and I'm trying to remedy the situation a little bit. But then another question, which may be even more important, is, uh, well, is any of that research useful? And when I first uh, started asking myself about that, about the research that I do or that I read in journals, uh, um, my immediate reaction was kind of emotional. And uh, I wrote this commentary uh, in honor of uh, late uh, uh, David Sackett, uh, where practically uh, the summary is, uh, uh, dear David, I'm really sorry, but I'm a big failure. Uh, and then I started thinking, uh, can I organize my thoughts a little bit more about that and, and why uh, research not only is not true, but at the mercy of uh, all sorts of multiplicity, uh, measurement error, um, random error, uh, biases, uh, selection, confounding, and another 314 biases, but also not useful. What do we need to have research being useful? Uh, so a, a paper that just came out today in PLOS Medicine is summarizing some of these thoughts and, and perspectives, and I will try to share them with you. So there's uh, eight features of uh, research that I think are essential to try to make a claim that uh, uh, research is useful. So you need to have a problem to fix. Uh, so there must be some problem base. Is there something that is a problem that is big, that is important enough to fix? Uh, or are we just uh, dealing with something that is completely um, not essential, or there's no disease and we're even creating disease on our own. Then what is the context placement? Uh, has prior evidence been systematically assessed to inform the need for any new studies? Uh, do we have enough already? Maybe we have more than enough uh, and we don't need any new studies. What is the information gain? How much are we going to get out of a new study that we're planning to do? Uh, is it um, uh, going to be a large enough study? Is it going to be long enough to capture outcomes that are important? Is it going to be informative? Uh, what is going to be the information gain? So information gain is a concept that goes back to the second law of thermodynamics. It's the same concept as entropy change. And uh, what we need for research is to have substantial entropy change. If we don't learn anything new, if it doesn't really change the or touch the dial of our evidence, then why are we doing it? Information gain has to be there both for quote unquote positive results and for negative results. If, if we run a study and we only feel that we will have some information gain, if we get a particular type of result, then we're stuck. You know, we will do everything possible, not necessarily fraud, but we'll be cutting corners in our own thinking to try to fit that result. So, no matter what the result is, we need to have some information gain. Obviously, some results will have more than others, but, but any result, including negative results, completely negative results, should have lots of information gain. Pragmatism. Does research reflect real life, real people, real settings? Um, not something that is very different from what we see in everyday clinical practice. Maybe it doesn't fit entirely the description of the patient that we have in mind, but if that's the case, does it really matter? Does that deviation make any difference and can we still use that research eventually to that setting or to these patients who are a bit different? Patient-centeredness. Um, have we taken into account what patients want to hear and learn and do? Or is it just uh, what the funders or the manufacturers or the sponsors uh, or we as clinicians or scientists have in mind, but not really what the patients have in mind. So are we centering our effort around patients? Value for money. Is it worth to spend all that money? Uh, so, you know, NIH spends about 70% on genomics and stem cell and regenerative medicine. Is that worth the investment? Uh, should we change our, our investment? 
uh, we want to run a clinical trial. Uh, we're going to spend a large amount of money sometimes, sometimes less is that money well spent or should we spend it in something else? Feasibility. Can this research be done? We know that about 30% of clinical trials don't get anywhere. They just stop because of futility. Um, other types of research, futility is far more common. We never hear about because if a study is futile, it will never appear in any journal. You know, it will never be published probably unless someone wants to publish, I tried this and I failed and I have nothing to show. And transparency. Obviously, this is a, a, a big uh, question on what do we exactly need to see for transparency. But um, I would argue that most of the research that we see is not transparent. Uh, methods, data, protocols uh, are not accessible. People cannot see them. They cannot scrutinize them. If they want to waste their lives trying to rerun analysis, they cannot find the data to, to do that. So. Some people would argue that, uh, uh, well, I know lots of papers that are useful. Uh, so does anyone know of a single paper in the biomedical literature that fits all eight criteria very well? Okay. No? No one? I, I've struggled. I cannot think of any. You know, I'm, I'm a pessimist probably. I think that very good papers probably score six or seven out of eight, but you know, eight out of eight is extremely difficult to, to score. How about if you decide to limit uh, your readings to just a few journals, like uh, BMJ, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Lancet, PLOS Medicine, Annals of Internal Medicine, and say that I will just read the top uh, core journal medical journals and leave all the specialty journals uh, uh, and the tail of tens of thousands of, of journals aside. Well, really, the situation doesn't improve much. I mean, it, it, it improves on a couple of indicators, like visibility. So, you know, how many papers have you seen in New England Journal of Medicine saying uh, we just failed? Not that many. However, in, in other dimensions, with few exceptions, uh, for example, maybe also context placement might be a bit better in some journals, like, you know, Lancet has um, some rule that you need to perform a systematic review to put your new research in context, most of the time the differences are not major. Uh, so it's not an issue that much of whether you go for uh, a major journal or the garden variety of any journal that may be publishing research. Still, most research that we read in journals, most research that we do, that I do, is probably not clinically useful. How can we improve uh, the situation? Well, I think that we need to tackle what are the key determinants of, of research and evidence-based research. So when evidence-based medicine was starting about 25 years ago, uh, these were the splendidly serving vested interest tools of non-evidence-based medicine. You, know, you he had ex cathedra, you know, that, that looks like a nice cathedra, um, pronouncements by experts and opinion leaders. Uh, you had editorials, I, I write loads of them. Uh, you had non-systematic reviews, I also write lots of them. Um, professional society guidelines that were done for the glory of the profession. You had pamphlets from drug reps and you also had other types of marketing materials floating around that were disseminated in scientific meetings. Now we have changed that, uh, clearly. And what we have now in 2016 the key tools of evidence-based medicine, but which are nevertheless still splendidly serving vested interests, are randomized trials and systematic reviews and guidelines. And then you have the whole flurry of observational studies and risk factor epidemiology and uh, all the sorts of the four Ps, uh, predictive medicine, precision medicine, personalized medicine, exomics, and, and lots of other initiatives that if you were to ask, what is their clinical utility? How much do we get out of those to try to, to make some sense and, and use them in real life? There's very, very little. And probably the most dangerous tool of evidence-based medicine has become physicians, which is part of the dipole. You need evidence and you need physicians, and I will explain why. So we all know that uh, having done thousands and probably tens of thousands of systematic reviews nowadays, uh, over the years, uh, we see that the quality of evidence usually is pretty low. 
Uh, this is an assessment of uh, 1,500 systematic reviews uh, published uh, by Cochrane, and it's an assessment with grade. Um, about half of them had a grade assessment. The other half that didn't, most of the time actually didn't have any evidence to, to talk about. Uh, not all of them, but, but a, a large share of them. Among those that did, uh, only about 13% had high quality of evidence for the primary outcome. And that became 19% if you were to ask for any primary outcome to have high quality of evidence. And when you focus on those that have high quality of evidence, there were only 25 that had also statistically significant results. And also the author said, yes, clearly, uh, this is a favorable interpretation that we're giving. Obviously, Cochrane reviewers are not encouraged to make recommendations, but that was a favorable interpretation. So you, you start from 1,500 reviews, and you end up with 25 that fulfill all of these criteria, high quality, statistical significance, and favorable interpretation. 30 years ago, or, or close to that, uh, Frankel and West had uh, uh, published these uh, data that probably haven't changed much since then. Uh, we had a problem with a problem base from the very beginning. Uh, what they described was that a patient dying from spongiform encephalopathy was taking two papers with him to the grave. Uh, conversely, things like varicose veins, even though they're very common and very important, lots of people suffer from them, there's not much molecular biology to think about it. And, and therefore, there was not investment in trying to get rid of, of that problem. This problem has continued, and currently the medical literature uh, is a huge nuisance of significant results. Uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, we published that paper in JAMA where we literally text mined the entire PubMed uh, since 1990. Uh, so all these millions of abstracts. And we also looked at one million, close to one million papers in full text and tried to extract all the p-values that were in there. 96% of these abstracts and 96% of these full text papers, whenever they had p-values, they had statistically significant p-values. Uh, and all of them, more or less, claimed that they had something novel to say. So you know, we have millions of discoveries that just go nowhere. Uh, discovery is a nuisance. We need something different. We need something that is useful, not just something that is statistically significant or is a claim for discovery. Now, the good news is that we are becoming a bit less successful over time. So the, the success rate has dropped from 98% to 95%. But unfortunately, we're still very successful. You know, so I, I hope that we can drop that to maybe 50 or 60% in, in the long-term future. We also know that even the most clearly statistically significant results don't go anywhere. Uh, even the creme de la creme, if you take the most highly cited papers uh, of statistically significant results with claims about clinical applicability uh, for interventions, about 40% of them are refuted within a few years by larger, better controlled, uh, better done studies. It has taken on average 25 years from discovering something until getting to that landmark success, and then about 40% of that dies uh, after a few years. Patient relevance and patient centeredness. Um, are we looking at outcomes that do make a difference for patients? And unfortunately not. Most of the studies that we do are ignoring what are the outcomes that would be important. Uh, I think that one of the fields that has the best track record is perinatal medicine. And uh, actually, this has been the core from which Cochrane eventually stemmed. Uh, this is an assessment of all the trials that are included in Cochrane systematic reviews uh, for preterm infants. And one of the major outcomes, probably the major outcome for preterm infants, uh, is chronic lung disease. You want to know what happened to these infants in terms of that outcome. However, only less than a third of the trials that were included and were focusing on preterm infants actually did look at that outcome. And when you look in more detail, you see that very often they looked at very different definitions of that outcome. So you cannot really compare notes. The vast majority of that literature is not transferable directly to what would be the core outcome uh, for this type of population. Always getting the right results is another threat. Um, we recently looked at head-to-head -head comparisons uh, of uh, one drug versus another drug that had been sponsored by the manufacturer of one of the two drugs being compared. 
97% of the time, the results were favorable for the manufactured drug. So you can take that for granted that these trials will have favorable results no matter what. I would say we can skip that step. We don't need these trials. Why should we run them? I mean, we, we know the answer already. Uh, why should they waste all that money? I mean, they can spend it on something different. Transparency. Uh, I think that this is the toughest of all pieces. Uh, and we have been scratching the surface of transparency. BMJ published the results of the reanalysis of study 329 recently, where it was realized that while the original paper had claimed that antidepressants were very effective and very safe, the reanalysis showed that actually the interventions were not effective and they were harmful. How often does that happen? Should we get paranoid uh, that even when we see some success, we should just say, no, it's just uh, completely non-transparent, so I cannot believe it? Well, we don't really know, because uh, if you look at how much transparency exists in the biomedical literature, this is an empirical survey that we did. We looked at 500 randomly selected papers from 2000 to 2014. About half of them had data, and how many of them had all their raw data available? You can probably read the abstracts, but um, any guess? Oh, you're such a pessimist, but indeed none, yes. <laughs> and how many had a protocol available? Much better. There was one that had a protocol available. And uh, actually, that was a separate paper. You know, trials, uh, it was a randomized trial that had published the protocol as a separate paper. So transparency is difficult because when you say, oh, I want to see all the data, you need to answer 25 challenges, which is a partial list shown here on who, how, when, why, where, uh, in what way, who's going to fund that, uh, resources, uh, credit, allocation, uh, guarantors, safeguards, and so forth. And, and eventually, when we do have raw access to data, sometimes you wonder whether it's worse. So, uh, when we reanalyzed the reanalysis of the 37 clinical trials that had been reanalyzed for the same PICO, the same question as the original paper, 35% of the time the conclusion was different on who are the patients to be treated or even whether patients should be treated or not. So one would think that these are research parasites, these are rogue analysts who are trying to attack honest researchers, but actually the reanalysts are the same as the original authors but they conclude something entirely different. Why is that? My explanation is that currently the only way to get published is to say something extravagant. You know, if you just say, I reanalyzed the data and I found the same thing, why should we publish that? You need to say, I found something different, but that's confusing. Who cares? It's something novel. It's innovative. <laughs> Containing the influence of conflicted stakeholders and authors can also go a long way. Um, is transparency of conflicts enough? We're doing much better in that regard, but is that enough? Should we allow anyone to do randomized trials? Should we allow anyone to perform uh, meta-analysis? Should we allow people with conflicts to be involved in guidelines? Or people who have expressed clear opinions about what they believe, even if they don't have conflicts? Who should fund research? Eventually, I think it becomes an issue of what are we incentivizing? The current system basically has three tires of research, blue sky science, preclinical and clinical research. Blue sky science clearly needs public support. When I do blue sky science, I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm working on cell cultures, and 200 years down the road, this knowledge will be helpful for radio telescopes to get me to the Andromeda galaxy. I, I have no clue. I cannot promise anything. Preclinical science is also funded by public funds, and I think this is a big mistake. Preclinical science has deliverables. You want to develop a new drug target. You want to develop a new test, a new diagnostic, a new something that will need to be tested to see if it, it works in people. So who has the incentive to develop something that works? Entrepreneurs and the industry. If you have academics, our incentive is to publish papers, to get promoted, to get more funding. At, at one point, I was involved in one grant, and we, I was writing that with a, a great colleague, and uh, I told her, you know, we need to change the design. This is not going to lead to a conclusive answer. And the response that I got, well, we don't want to get a conclusive answer. If we get a conclusive answer, what are we going to do for the next funding cycle? <laughs> uh, so uh, we need to realign our priorities. I think entrepreneurs should fund preclinical research. And once you have the drug target identified, then 
you go again for public funding, for clinical trials, for evidence-based research that needs to be independent, it needs to be unconflicted, and now let's test these new drug targets and these new tests and these new technologies, do they work or not? There's a movement in the opposite direction, and I will close with that, because uh, many people say we need less transparency. We need to protect secrecy. We need to protect trade. We need to protect uh, innovators who are working in the dark and suddenly come out of the blue to conquer the world. And this is what I saw when I was walking in Palo Alto um, about two years ago. I came across uh, a company that had a weird Greek-sounding name, Theranos. Uh, so being Greek, uh, I thought, well, that sounds like Tyrannos uh, or Thanatos, which is death. Um, but I found out, actually, that that was therapy and diagnosis, and they were proposing that they will disrupt uh, the entire medical system with new type of blood testing that you can do very fast at no cost and hundreds of tests, and everybody will be tested in pharmacies and supermarkets, and, and uh, you will be tested every day, and you will find out what will happen to you. And now, about a year and a half later, we know that the company has been scrutinized uh, by FDA, by federal authorities, by Department of Health. They claim that what it does is probably carrying a high risk of death. They have abandoned their technology. They're under scrutiny for criminal potentially charges for misleading consumers and, and uh, investors and, uh, and patients. So, and they had to retract tens of thousands of their tests. Uh, they still haven't published anything because that's the way that they have operated all along. And I hope that they do publish and they get things straight, but I'm not very hopeful. So finally, how do physicians get involved? This is what David Sackett said about evidence-based medicine when he defined that along with uh, Gordon Wyatt and others. Uh, evidence-based medicine is about integrating individual clinical expertise with the best external evidence. However, clinicians are under tremendous market pressure. Most discussions in department meetings are about money, and this is mostly becoming finance-based medicine rather than evidence-based medicine. Clinicians are incentivized not to do clinical research or to apply clinical research. I think that we are incentivized to capture the largest possible market share, to satisfy customers, to get high satisfaction scores, to charge more, to perform more procedures, to tick off more items and charge forms. Unavoidably, when you have the setting, it's unlikely that physicians will design studies that threaten their jobs, decrease their procedures, their tests, and the interventions that they are making their living out of. So is EBM and clinical research doomed to be hurtily accepted only when it leads to more medicine if it means less health? My conclusions. Clinical research should be useful. I think that it should make a difference for health and disease outcomes or should be undertaken with that as a realistic prospect. Many of the features that make clinical research useful can be identified. And I think that uh, looking at the problem base, at the context placement, the information gain, the pragmatism, the patient-centeredness, the value for money, the feasibility, and eventually the transparency are key for determining that we have useful to research to deal with. Most research, unfortunately, fails on most of these fronts. And there's very few studies that would score very high. And uh, the forces driving the production and dissemination of non-useful clinical research are largely identifiable and correctable. They're modifiable, so I think we can do something about it. I will close with a slide showing some of my collaborators who have uh, been tortured over the years and have tolerated me, and thank you for tolerating me.